Would you come forward then? Please. Let me call some other. Ashley Thompson, Sheena Loosley, Father Thomas Foucher. Go ahead. My name is Joe Allison Smith. I live in Nampa, Idaho. How is it possible, committee members, that the words that sound equal are in reality totalitarian, un-American words? I will tell you a lot about a lot of little birds that sat together peacefully on a wire. Then a 20-pound turkey did so-called equally, sat on the wire and stretched it to a shape unusable by any bird but himself. Just because he's different? No, his mathematical properties produced a destructive result upon the wire. The wire we're talking about here today is freedom, Americanism. The proposed protected classes committee members also have different mathematical properties from the classes of people already listed in the existing anti-discrimination law. It is a scientific and mathematical fact that different actions do not produce equal results in the world. In fact, class by skin color is not comparable to class by sexual acts and gender presentations because skin color is not an action at all. Anti-discrimination law is meant to allow individuals to be judged by their character and actions rather than by a physical attribute that does not impact the world. Sexual orientation and gender identity do not compare to any of the previously listed protected classes, except for creed, religion. This is also built on a belief system and is also accompanied by a defined set of behaviors. The definition of a Christian, by the way, is no more a person who attends church on Sundays than the definition of gay is to gather with friends to talk about sex. This is why the First Amendment specifically protects the free exercise of religion. Sexual orientation, gender identity, and creed are all belief systems carrying with them defined behaviors. The difference is people are not accustomed to thinking of the belief that homosexuality is good as a statement of faith, as a religion, even though they know some strongly believe it while some strongly don't. The traditional religious of America you see gladly embrace the First Amendment restriction from using government to coerce others to say our beliefs are true. Speaking for Christians, our doctrine wants true belief. Forced confessions don't even count and we don't want to use government for that. But this First Amendment restriction happily protects us from religions that have no problem using the biggest gun they can find, the government, to, convert, to, to coerce conversion. The LGTB movement is such a coercive belief system, we can tell because it has, it has already used the law in so many states to abridge free speech by legally changing the definition of the word marriage. You have less than 30 seconds. Changing the meaning of the words coming out of a man's mouth is removing his ability to communicate in an Orwellian, newspeak vein. It is removing people's ability to understand the world fully, which is why we would unilaterally reject a bill that propose, proposes that cows and horses both be called horses, no matter how much the two have in common. Likewise, every person, regardless of religion or lack of it, has a basic human right to notice that the components and results of marriage are different from those of gay relationships, and to say one is not the other without punishment by government. Every person has a right to say it as an employer, as a coworker, as a business owner. No one has the right to shut them up by crying discrimination and bringing the force of government down on them. Your, your time has expired. Please, please wrap up as quickly as you can. The other crucial difference in this impact on the world is the type of arena it invades where an employer would have no occasion to say to a client, Jesus is Lord, for the benefit of an employee. A transgendered man expects his employer and coworkers to introduce him as a woman. This is a lie for a Christian. Thank you for Could you restate your name so we can find you on the list here? Joe Allison Smith. Allison Smith? Joe Allison Smith. Joe Allison? Yes, I signed up yesterday. Joe Allison Smith. Joe Allison Smith. Okay. We'll find you on the list somewhere so we can check out that you've testified. Are there, any Are there questions? Thank you for coming. Carrie Sands, good. Ashley Thompson. Sheena Loosley. Father Thomas Foucher. Emily Shannon.
James Blakely, Steve McPherson, Alan Hines, Gretchen Bates, Stephen Caven, We had someone come up here. Please state your name for the record. Hello, my name is Emily Shannon. I live in uh, Nampa, Idaho. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, thank you for hearing us. Today I represent myself as well as friends all over Idaho who have tearfully asked me to speak for them as they cannot publicly support HB2 without fear for their safety and their jobs. I knew from a young age that other children thought that I was different than them. Kids would angrily demand to know why my hair was short, why I didn't wear dresses. I never understood these lines of questions because I was simply being who I am. By the time I entered middle school, words like dyke were hurled at me. Teachers would hear these things and not stop them. I remember thinking at 12 years old that I didn't fit that if the real world was like school, I never would. I held on to the hope that high school would be better. Sadly, I was wrong. In high school, the cruelty escalated from verbal to also physical attacks. Epithets were hurled at me still, and I was shoved into lockers. My car was vandalized. The word dyke scratched on it. Finally, I sought out help from administration. I was told that there was nothing that they could do for me, that my issues were not covered, not written into the policy. One counselor even suggested that maybe, perhaps if I didn't look so gay, kids would stop harassing me. These statements from administration told me that it was my fault that I was being treated cruelly, that something was wrong with me and not with the other students. By the time I graduated from high school, I wondered if I had a future in Idaho or a future at all. I was alone, vulnerable, and scared. I thought about ending my life almost every day. I thought it was the only option to get away from the pain, shame, and fear from a world that told me that I was sick and wrong, that I deserved to be treated cruelly. Being young and watching teacher after teacher not stop the cruelty had a negative effect on me. I don't know if any of the teachers were sympathetic, but maybe just too afraid to step in, then be labeled as gay themselves and lose their jobs. Or perhaps they just did not know what to do. In either case, I rarely felt safe. You have about 30 seconds. Had the protections in HB2 been in place, my situation could have been different. Those protections would have assured me that I would not be treated as a second-class citizen. That my fate in Idaho as a member of a minority, I could apply to any job and be considered based on my qualifications, not on my sexual orientation or gender identity. And most importantly, it would have told me that my home state considered me a whole person. I implore you to pass House Bill 2, not only for me, but for every single teenager across Idaho, questioning what their life in Idaho will be. Give me hope. Give them hope. Give us hope. Are there questions? Representative McCrosty. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, Ms. Shannon, it has been uh, stated before uh, this body uh, just a little bit earlier that uh, when gay people get together, all they do is talk about sex. And I would like to find out from you, when you get together with other LGBT individuals, do you talk about anything besides sex? And yes. could you Chairman, describe what those things would be? I object. If, I think we're going over the top there a little bit. Mr. Let's, Chairman. let's be awfully careful. I'll defer. Answer the question. That's, that's a very highly personal question about what people talk about. Uh, so you don't have to answer that. I will just say that uh, I talk a lot about a lot of things with a lot of different people. Um, I'm a dog groomer, a student, um, and when I get together with people who may or may not have the same sexual orientation and gender identity as me, we do talk about a lot of different things. Further questions? Thank you. Thank you. James Blakely. Uh, 
Go ahead, sir. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> my name is James Blakely, and I currently reside in Boise, Idaho. Dear Ch Mr. Chairman and committee members, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak here today. I originally grew up in Washington State, but came to Idaho to attend college at the University of Idaho, where I earned my Bachelor's of Science degree in Environmental Science. While at U of I, I fell in love with Moscow, the Palouse, and in general, Idaho. After graduation, I went on to serve my community, community of Moscow through an AmeriCorps program, which is a one-year program similar to that of the Peace Corps, but in the US. Shortly after serving in AmeriCorps, I left Idaho to pursue other career opportunities. I would like to point out that the AmeriCorps program has the words sexual orientation and gender identity added to their hiring and non-discrimination policy. In May of 2013, I found myself once again back in Idaho to start a new job, this time in Boise, where I currently reside. Not long after moving back, I was shocked to learn that in the GEM state that it is legal to fire someone based on their sexual orientation or gender identity. I personally wasn't worried about my job security as the organization that I was working for was not only LGBT friendly, but they valued people based on their work ethics and performance. And, it, and this was another organization that had these words added to their hiring and non-discrimination policy. However, as I met more people of the LGBT community, I learned that not all businesses and organizations here in Idaho are like that. I kept hearing heartbreaking stories of blatant discrimination. I am not here to debate the interpretation of the Bible or religion, or even to proceed, persuade you to change your views on homosexuality, because at the end of the day, that is not what this bill is about. This bill is simply to to prevent discrimination against gay and transgender people in the workplace and in housing. I am not a business owner, but I have been a manager of a business, and I've held manager type positions at various governmental and nonprofit organizations. I have had a hand at hiring and managing people. And simply put, it would have been bad for business for me to discriminate against anyone for anything. For a business organization, I want the best and most qualified people on my team that will help my organization or business thrive and succeed. Yeah, about I've, 30 seconds. Thank you. When it comes to being able when it comes to being able to earn a living, having a place to live, or being served by a business, everyone should be treated the same and not discriminated against. That's what adding the words is about, to ensure that our gay and transgendered friends, neighbors, family, and coworkers are treated fairly and equally under the laws of our state. Thank you. Are there questions? questions? Thank you. Steve McPherson. Alan Hines. Gretchen Bates. Let me get some others on deck here before we begin. My name is Gre I'm standing on tiptoes. <laughs> you don't need to do that. You can pull that microphone down. I know it doesn't seem to be very friendly, but is that better? Go ahead, proceed. My name is Gretchen Bates, and thank you for letting us be here. Imagine the four black college students from Greensboro, North Carolina, left to find another restaurant after being refused service at the Woolworth lunch counter. Imagine if Rosa Parks got off the bus to find another where she would be welcomed. If these brave people had not stood up for what they believed and know what is just and fair, would be, we be defending our religious liberty to not bake a cake for an interracial couple? Religious liberty must have limits. It's when it hurts someone else. A few years ago, my best friend's son and his transgender partner jumped together off the Prine Bridge in Twin Falls. Matt was 20. Amy was 18. I cannot imagine the hopelessness and the despair that they felt. But I do know of the sadness that Matt's mother feels every day. <gasps> Many tell Idaho gay and transgender people just to go away, 
to go elsewhere for work and services, even go out of state. Matt and Amy believed that they had nowhere to go, so they chose the escape of death. Your support of House Bill 2 will create an environment where young people feel valued, accepted, safe, and welcome. And I'm 68 years old, and I am so proud to stand with all these brave young people here. I've never been that brave. Thank you. Are there questions? Thank you for being here. Stephen Caven. Let me get some more on deck here. Uh, Molly O'Shea, Jade Walker, David Lincoln, Chelsea. Okay, that's right, we did last night, didn't we? It's been a long time since last night. Charity Strong, Becky Carson Eisman, Carolyn Blackhurst. Go ahead. Mr. Chairman and committee, good morning. My name is Stephan Cavan and I live in Caldwell. I've lived in Idaho since I was 10 years old and now I am 21 and a senior history and business major at the College of Idaho. I also happen to be gay. And while it's a part of me, it isn't a definition. Yet my entire life, it, not me, has been the focus. As a freshman in college, I tried to get a job waiting tables to help put myself through school and was asked by my orient about my orientation directly by one of the managers. When I answered truthfully, immediately I was told the position had been filled. Months later, one evening, I was walking to my car in Boise when I was physically attacked, beaten in the street by two young men yelling the most filthy names you can imagine at me. I didn't report this. I was afraid I would be discriminated against by police, a decision I regret after becoming close with Chief Mike Masterson this past year. But today nothing has changed. I'm still afraid. I'm afraid of business owners when I look for a job. I'm afraid of every person I pass on the street when I'm alone at night. And I'm afraid of you, my leaders, the highest public officials in the state, afraid that I won't have your support in my time of need. I'm not asking you to move mountains. I'm asking for you to be a strong shoulder I can lean against, for you to stand with me and say that cruelty in a just society is not acceptable. We are the people and we are free, but we can never forget that the liberties of everyone are diminished when the liberties of a few are threatened. All I'm asking is to be judged by my qualifications, my character, my performance, to work hard and make meaningful contributions to my community. This is my time of need and I hope you'll help me with a yes vote on House Bill 2. Thank you. Are there questions? Thank you. Mr. Chairman, now you had called Father Fauché earlier. I just wanted to let you know that he is not able to attend, but has submitted his written testimony in support of House Bill 2. Will it be entered into the record? Um, Molly O'Shea. Jade Walker will be next. Charity Strong. Becky Carson Eisman. Begin. Mr. Chairman, esteemed committee members, my name is Molly O'Shea. I'm here from Boise, Idaho. I'm an educator of 40 years. I know what you're thinking. She must have started teaching when she was 12, right? <laughs> every, every, every male on this committee <laughs> knows not to touch that with a 30-foot pole. <laughs> Most of all, I'm here as an ally and a supportive voice for educators, students, and families at Bora High School and the other high schools in our Boise City. I advocate the passage of HB2 in the name of all of our LGBT students who are working jobs during their high school career and beyond to be judged upon the quality of their work. On Tuesday, you heard a list of businesses endorsing and re-endorsing HB2, many of whom I was honored to make those calls to. Mr. Chairman, esteemed committee members, our public classrooms 
are the American experience in progress, and in part because we are the day-to-day -day examples of what anti-discrimination laws do for our youth, for our state, for our nation. I have three short stories, please. The first story to emphasize how anti-discrimination laws protect and support our youth and our nation is Musna Ali. Musna is a refugee from Somalia, partially dressed in her hajib, which just means the covering of her head and a long dress. In class, we had groupings of which one of the group, there was a gay student. One of the group members within his group absolutely began to say, y'all gay, y'all gay, I can't be with you anyway. Musna Ali jumped out of her seat even before I could leap across the classroom. And you know what this student did? In her hajib, in her deepest faith of being Muslim, she stood up hand on hip before yeah, about her 30 teacher, seconds, ma'am. And she shook her finger to this student and said, we in America, we don't talk like that. We are equal. She wants to be a businesswoman. She will change this environment. And she needs your protection, as well as our student that was being harassed. Last story, Eta Yuso comes to America, transgender. She is on the bus, she's in different restaurants, and she is being so harassed that she attempted suicide. She was one of my students. We went to her support at the hospital, and ultimately, Eta Yuso, who had changed her name to mean health and beauty and love for all, she had changed her name in coming to America, believing that she would have equal protection, anti-discrimination laws to protect who she was. And yet, in our own city, she was so harassed and physically beaten up that she attempted suicide. And she is now in the state of Colorado, safe in a job in a florist company. I implore you, in the name of our youth, in the name of anti-discrimination laws, where we as public educators are able to practice this great experience and experiment in democracy in our great republic, pass House Bill 2. Thank you. Are there questions? Thank you. Jade Walker. Charity Strong, Becky uh, Carson Eisman, Carolyn Blackhurst. Go ahead. I placed my name on the list yesterday morning. I cannot stay this afternoon. Give us your name. Uh, you know, we're, we're trying to accommodate everyone and their schedules. Uh, recognize we have a schedule, too. We've got, we've got about uh, uh, 40 minutes left this morning before we need to be on the floor. Uh, it's almost impossible for us to accommodate everyone that way, but, you know, we will do our best. So would you please pass a note up to us so we can, uh, those who cannot attend again this afternoon. So that we have a chance to get you get you heard. Go ahead, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Jade Walker. I'm from Caldwell. I'm freaking out a little bit internally right now. Um, I don't speak very well in middle school. My teachers actually thought I was mute. I never said anything to contradict them. So please forgive me if I speak poorly or tell unnecessarily anecdotes about middle school. I am a third generation Idahoan from Caldwell. 
From the time I was very young, my grandma would make me take me and my siblings and my cousins and my younger aunts and uncles to the Capitol during legislative sessions. While our beliefs may differ, she instilled in me the idea that it is the responsibility of every citizen to fight for what they believe in. For most of my life, I sadly have not done this. I stayed silent. But today I am following her example and standing here in support of House Bill 2, even though people are scary. I've been afraid for most of my life, I'm afraid of myself, afraid of what I was, afraid of how my family and friends and neighbors might react if they found out who I was, afraid that the future I previously thought was boundless might be limited if I was true to myself, also of snakes. As a sophomore in high school, I made the mistake in confiding in someone I thought was a friend in the hopes that she could give me answers. I told her that I was gay and possibly transgender, but she had no answers. And by the end of the day, she had told several other students. Before I knew it was happening, there was a group of students that seemed to have made it their life goal to make my life miserable. But I figured that was just high school, and I convinced myself that all I had to do was make it through, the, and then everything would be better. I put on the front of being a perfect, normal, heterosexual girl. I think I was a pretty good actor, except for maybe the normal part. I was a member of Key Club, National Honor Society, the Mayor's Youth Advisory Council, and dedicated myself to being the most consistently out of tune violist in the orchestra. I graduated in the top of my class at Caldwell High School. I went to the College of Idaho on an academic scholarship and moved out of my parents' house. But things didn't magically get better like I had hoped. I still felt like my family wouldn't want me if they knew who I was, that people didn't want to be around me. You have about 30 seconds. And at the lowest moment of my life, a month before my 19th birthday, I attempted to kill myself, but I was not successful. Uh, there have been many moments since then where I wish I had been. Uh, this terrifies me. It also terrifies me that for years afterward, I didn't get the help I needed because I was too afraid of the social and professional consequences of doing so. I've since spoken to several Idahoans that seem to have the same narrative. And that terrifies me more than anything else on a long list of things that terrifies please, me. Please wrap it up as soon as you can. This is my personal reason for supporting House Bill 2. I want Idahoans that may be going through something similar to what I went through to know that Idaho does care about them. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Are, are there questions? Thank you. Uh, Reverend Cameron. Kind of go in a different order here. Good morning. I'm the Reverend Lynn Stanglin Cameron, Minister of the Unitarian Universalist Church in Idaho Falls. And I'm a mother, a grandmother, a taxpayer, and a voter. I would remind you that not all religious groups object to adding the words. In fact, many religious groups support that piece of legislation. Adding the words sexual orientation and gender identity will not jeopardize our religious freedoms. In fact, we welcome legislation that protects people, all people. My Unitarian Universalist denomination has long supported full equality for gay, lesbian, transgender, and bisexual people. The first of our seven Unitarian principles states that we covenant to affirm and promote the inherent worth and dignity of every person. We seek truth and understanding from science and reason, and we find wisdom in many traditions, including Jesus' mandate that the most important teaching is that we love our neighbors as ourselves. In Salt Lake City in 2009, we UUs launched the Standing on the Side of Love campaign as a program to extend love and nonviolent support for equality for all. It is an interfaith program. I also represent PFLAG. 
Eastern Idaho's parents, family, and friends of lesbians and gays has been meeting at my church for more than 20 years. The founders and present chairs of that group have spent those years struggling to find support and protection from discrimination for LBGT people, particularly our Idaho youth and their families. Often parents come to PFLAG when their young people have the courage to reveal their sexual orientation or gender identity. Parents come to PFLAG because they seek better to better support their gay and lesbian children, because they're looking for people who understand that their kids are the same people they were before they came out of the closet. And out of fear, those parents look, look to PFLAG to help them find support for the well-being of their gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender children. Yeah, about Many seconds. families have been terrified that they could not protect their children. They are fully aware of the vilification and fear of LGBT that is accepted in some religious communities and preached from many pulpits. Fortunately, the past decades have gradually brought increased access to information and acceptance, just as science and technology have led the changes and medical and psychological research, the arts and the media have helped society accept people who are gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender. Your, the business your and cultural communi communities have already moved up. to recognize that LGBT people deserve to enjoy the same benefits and protections as everyone else. I commend you members of this committee for your patience and your willingness to listen to all of the impassioned testimony. I urge you, I sincerely urge you to vote to support this bill. Add the words gender orientation and gender, sexual orientation and gender identity to Idaho's human rights law because it's, it's the good and loving, reasonable thing to do adding those words is the right thing to do. It is right to protect all people in Idaho. Adding the words will help that long arc of the universe to bend toward justice right here in our state. Are there questions? Thank you. Okay. I'm gonna call a few, we have quite a few notes that have come forward. We'll try to accommodate those here uh, before we move on.